Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending May 16th. First up, this is from International Business Times, and this is uh, something that's very important if you're considering using a solid-state hard drive in your computer in the future. This is uh, basically directed towards enterprise drives, but also talks about the regular solid-state drives that consumers use. While hard drives are mechanical in nature and make use of rapidly rotating disks coated with magnetic material, flash storage devices are completely electronic, making use of a chip to process the data so the data can be transferred much faster into smaller devices that are also more durable if dropped. Basically what they are doing is they're just the same kind of chips that you have in a thumb drive. They're just stacked together in some type of an array. And according to a recent presentation by Seagate's Alvin Cox, uh, the period of time which data can be retained on SSDs is halved by every 5 degrees, 9 degrees Fahrenheit rise in temperature in the area where the SSD is stored. Consumer class SSDs can store data for up to two years before the standard drops, but when it comes to SSDs used by enterprises, the drives are only expected to retain data for a period of three months, a fact confirmed by Samsung, Seagate, and Intel's own rating on their products. And without being powered up, the enterprise type of uh, hard drives can only be expected to uh, retain the data without mistakes and corruption for a period of about seven days so that is something to be very concerned about um, if you're in an enterprise type of a situation you're probably using most of these solid state drives to just transfer data back and forth and back and forth at a high rate of speed but not necessarily for data retention and you would probably have something like a RAID array backup or something like that and uh, have hot swappable drives but also be aware too if you're using consumer drives uh, SSDs you've only got about two years there before you're uh, likely to start having mistakes in it um, in the storage and stuff like that so a good backup program is always very very important I would not keep anything really valuable on a solid state drive it's great to use for a uh, your main drive for booting up and stuff like that, but keep all of your important data and backups of everything um, on another type of drive or another type of storage medium, such as I've talked about in before M-Disk. If you look up M-Disk, that's a very good storage medium, and it seems to be uh, very well laid out. And next, this is from PC Gamer, and thank you, Damien T., for uh, providing this world's first nine dollars computer they were asking for this is a kickstarter program and they were asking for a startup uh... donations of a amount of fifty thousand dollars to get started so they could actually produce these nine dollar linux computers well they blasted past the fifty thousand dollars and i think as of now they're well over one point three million dollars so this thing is really going to happen it's uh... Uh, they're talking about, well, I'll just read the little part here. The tiny computer runs mainline Linux and thus can access thousands of open source apps such as LibreOffice, Chromium, and more. It's also only $9, putting the $35 Raspberry Pi to shame. And underneath the little video here that PC Gamer shows is the little link. Just click the red Kickstarter link, and if you donate $9 to the project, which is the price of the computer, in December they will send you one out, and you've got 20 days to do it. There's... 20 days left on the Kickstarter project, so uh, get on if you want one of these little $9 computers to try out. And uh, They've got a demonstration here, and evidently it runs a browser and other things like that just fine, so if you're interested in getting in on this, get in in uh, the next 20 days. Next, this is something I've talked about before. This is, they call it Solar Freaking Roadways. This has been making the rounds of Facebook and all kinds of social media and stuff like that. And uh, these things were sent in, I'd like to thank Tim P, Bill B, and William H for all of the different links to this. But I will get into the solar roadways again because there's obviously people that are interested in them. This first one is from uh, sciencealert.com. The solar road in Netherlands is working even better than expected. Now, this isn't actually a solar roadway. This is a solar bike path. They did that as a test, which I think is a good way to actually test it to start with. But uh, the Netherlands made it the actual uh, head of the actual title of the article is The Solar Road in Netherlands is Working Even Better Than Expected, which I have a rebuttal to that by a, a person that I'll talk about in just a few minutes. But here's what they say. The Netherlands made headlines last year when it built the world's first solar road, an energy harvesting bike path paved with glass-coated solar panels. Now six months into the trial, engineers say the system is working even better than expected with the 70-meter test bike path generating 3,000 kilowatt hours or enough electricity to power a small household for a year. Now, you're talking about, too, that in a bike path, they're not able to, uh, just like a roadway, you're not able to tilt the solar panels to get the best angle, and you also have to coat it in thick glass 
to be able to uh, stand the traffic and uh, because you're talking about just the weight of bicycles even you're not talking about thick enough panels to stand the weight of a car and then you're also talking about there has to be some kind of a surface on top they did have a few problems with that I think they had one of the panels actually fracture during the test which you know when you have a test prototype that's to be expected and they also said there was a problem with some of the surface peeling away you have to have some type of a grip surface on it because you certainly don't want to have a slip glass as part of a roadway system especially if you have any kind of rain or snow or anything like that it's just going to become one big ice skating rink so still some things to work with about that but I'm also going to give you the link to um, VERT I believe it is the environmental road trip this is the guy that talks about, I guess basically he designed it based on a government grant and talks about all the positive aspects of it. Uh, one thing that they talk about in the second one, the guy that rebuts some of it, is uh, putting LEDs in all of it. I don't see the sense if you're generating solar power, use it for something useful. You don't need the entire roadway to be filled with LED lights. Uh, I don't think a, a, a lit up roadway is that necessarily that great of a thing. In, in small areas like crosswalks and stuff like that, he talks about Part of it has some electronic circuitry to where if somebody steps into the crosswalk, it actually lights up a little bit of um, area of the roadway to call your attention. Yeah, that I can possibly see, but to have LEDs in every section of the roadway all the way along, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have a problem seeing the roadway as long as the line markers are right. As long as you got good yellow center lines and good white lines on the edges, it's not like I'm not going to be able to tell the roads there in front of me. So um, this fact of having to have LEDs on all of them, I think that can be put aside. Also, people have brought up the fact, too, if you're in urban areas to where there's just a lot of traffic jams all the time, the road's basically going to be in the shade all the time. So I don't know having it be a solar roadway is really going to help you in that case, too. It's probably more something that would be efficient in parts of the desert southwest where you have uh, lots of nice big sunny days and lots of roadways that maybe only have traffic 10% of the time or less. And then the very final one is by... EEV blog where he actually does the geek stuff and gives you all the different numbers and stuff like that and it ends up being that even though the uh, article claims the solar road in the Netherlands is working even better than expected it's actually working exactly as you would expect it to work and exactly what they predicted it to be which is not necessarily a bad thing but well I'll let him give you all the different ideas and stuff like that basically he does the same thing I'm talking about too he gets in the first part of it and says you know why do we need these LED lights? I mean, it just you don't need to light up the whole L roadway with LED lights. Uh, we can, you know, do away with those and then use the electricity for something more useful than lighting the road. And then he gets into the figures of uh, comparing it to other people that have solar panels. And then at the very end of his video, something very interesting, he talks about a strategy they're using right now in South Korea. What they're doing there is they're elevating the solar panels above the road and putting them in the median strips so you can have them angled towards the sun. And then what also it does is it actually shades the median and they put a bike path there. So between the lanes of traffic, like say we have a four-lane expressway with a median strip, put the solar panels in the median strip, um, elevate them up about maybe 10 feet or so, and then just have a nice shaded bike path in the middle for a bike for a people to ride their bicycles. So. Um, if you get a chance to check out that video. And then last up, this is from WashingtonPost.com. Scientists have discovered the first fully warm-blooded fish. Um, that's another article that's a little overhyped. It's not fully warm-blooded. It's a warm, warmer-blooded fish. This is a deep-water fish called the... Well, let me see, get, get the name right here. Well, first I'll just read it here. In a paper published today in Science, researchers from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration described the unique mechanism that enables the OPA, a deepwater predatory fish, to keep its body warm. The secret lies in a specially designed set of blood vessels in the fish's gills, which allows the fish to circulate at warm blood through its entire body. So basically what it does is it preserves heat by having the uh, cold blood vessels that are leaving the body and then pumping in the other um, blood vessels in the gill that are bringing the, the cooler uh, the cooler, well, let me, I'm kind of confused in this. What it is is your, the gills have a, a corkscrew type of mechanism. So you've got the warm blood and the cooler blood in the body, and by having them in, in contact with each other, the warm blood transfers to the cooler blood and then goes and warms it up and then brings it back in the body. What you have a problem with deep water fish is the prey and the predators. Because it's so cold and dark, everything is slowed down. These are basically... Um, cold-blooded creatures so what predators tend to do is they don't use much energy because they don't have much so they tend to lie in wait for a, a slow 
moving fish to swim by and then capture it that way. They don't go after it. But this fish evidently can raise its body temperature by about 5 degrees and move a little bit faster and actually be a good predator type of fish and chase down slower moving prey. So um, gives it a little bit of advantage there and everything. So kind of a cool discovery there. So anyway, if you get a chance, to check out these articles. As usual, all the links to all the articles below uh, will be in the description box. Thank you to everybody that contributed this week, and take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.